Hello everybody, welcome to the SABC online service. So good to have you all with us today. We've got a sweet lineup for you, starting off with some praise and worship, hopefully get you into the spirit. Then we're transitioning into some messages and we hope you find it inspiring and we would love to see you here next Sunday with us.
looking in this place I worship you I worship you You are way maker, miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness My God, that is who you are You are
Well, thank you, and thank you everybody for um, coming on this journey with me of writing a book. <laughs> As you will see, I now have uh, a new uh, publisher, and uh, the publishing company is Torn Curtain in Wellington, and Anya is the new publisher, and she's done this mock-up of the book cover for me. She couldn't get the book done in time. She said, I've got to re-edit the whole thing. It's going to take four months. It won't be ready till mid-November, but I'll do you a book cover. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very thrilled when she picked out this photo out of some I'd sent to put in the book. And um, we talked about what we'd have written on it. For me, no matter what, is pretty obvious, the ups and downs of life. But um, my answer that I really wanted on this was, no matter what, I know I'm beloved by God. That's what I've learned in my journey. But everyone says, oh, it's a bit old hat. But anyway, I can say it. <laughs> and when she asked me to explain, well, what does it really mean? You know, I said, well, it's God's faithfulness. I mean, he's always been there. And so my book is really um, a journey through God's call and uh, the ups and downs of life on the mission field, dealing with things like uh, not being able to do nursing like I thought I was going to and ending up doing church planting and student ministry and totally being thrown on God in a way that I just had to learn to lean on him every day. I love the songs we sang, Casting Away Fear and Doubt. They were a very real part of my life in the early days and for a long time, actually. But um, I learned to cling to God and to cling to his promises and I found him faithful all the time. The lady there is Pansy, my language teacher. I'll talk about her in a few minutes. So, yes, so just a brief summary of my um, journey coming from a normal family on the outside of the family photos, thanks. Um, but inside, very, um, both mum and dad were pretty, came from dysfunctional families and... Dad went to St. Andrew's boarding school for eight years because his parents had divorced, and so he felt like he was in prison. Every, almost every day he got the cane, and he was forced to go to uh, church every day with the boarders, and so you can imagine what he thought about God, getting caned every day, no love, <laughs> no, no acceptance, and he was totally anti-God, didn't want anything to do with him. But after 20 years of a difficult marriage and mum praying regularly, he came to the Lord through a miracle of God's healing. And that was amazing. And this promise, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and all your family. It's one we can claim for our families. And we saw God do that in a miraculous way. Next one, thanks. So I gave my life to the Lord when I was 11. And I'm really grateful. And actually the thing that brought me to God was... Um, pain in my life. I ended up feeling uh, af afraid, ashamed, fearful, unworthy, having been molested as a eight-year-old girl. I looked it up online yesterday and it said one out of three women experiences this before they're 16. And it really totally shut me down and totally made me hardly functioning really and not able to relate to people. But God was gracious. He enabled me to go and do my nursing training. And um, when I got there, I met the navigators who offered to disciple me. Next one, thanks. And that was fantastic to have input into my life, teaching me how to know the word of God, how to grow in a relationship with Christ, how to receive his promises. And that became the foundation for my life. And the passion for discipleship, the Great Commission was preached regularly, and every time I heard it preached, I thought, well, that's me. I can make disciples. Well, I didn't think I could, but um, <laughs> I felt every time I heard it, it was God's call on my life. And so I learned to make disciples in Christchurch and in Wellington. And um, I never realized, I love this in the Passion, Jesus came close to them and said, all authority of the universe has been given to me. Now go on my authority and make disciples of all nations. I never realized that we went in Christ's authority. I just thought it meant he had authority and he was in control. But 
I didn't know about the authority that God had given us. And, um, but his promise, don't forget, I'm with you every day, even to the completion of this age. But he says, don't just go and make converts, go and make disciples, get alongside them, teach them, train them. And that's what I experienced that enabled me to become functional because I just had to cling to God and his promises. So a few weeks ago, I had a woman who I had discipled in Wellington, Kathy. She rang me up 45 years ago. I discipled her. I hadn't talked to her for 10 years, and she said, do you have any financial needs? Um, we're just wondering if you have any needs right now. And I said, oh, I've just put my book in for publishing today. She said, oh, good. <laughs> we want to, uh, you know, support you with it. So two days later, she sent me half the amount for the publishing fee. So that was really encouraging, I thought, because I'd said, well, God, I could use my savings, but if you're my father, if you'd like to provide, that would be lovely. And it was only <laughs> four hours later that she rang. <laughs> yeah, so you don't have because you don't ask, you know. God is amazing. And then the next day, another person said to me, oh, can you give me your bank account? I'd like to make a contribution too. So it's getting up there. Anyway, God is amazing, and you'll find there's lots and lots of um, ways in which God has led and blessed my call to Thailand. I've shared it quite a few times, but um, well, I met Avril Bennett, and she told me about the accident that there'd been in Manor and Christian Hospital, and there'd been 12 doctors, nurses, and children killed in a van accident. They'd all been out on a picnic. This was the year before I talked to Avril, and, and it was through her that I got the call to go to Manor and Christian Hospital, I thought, well, I'm a nurse, I'm a midwife, I'm trained, ideal place to go. I can't be a real missionary, I can be a nurse, and I can disciple. Um, but when I got to Thailand, and I, I studied for six months to do the nursing examination in Thai, um, I'd been told in Singapore that the government had changed their mind, I couldn't sit the nurse's exam, but I thought, no, God's given me a promise. He will lead me to the place he's prepared for me. So I absolutely knew he was going to change the government's mind. Well, funny, he didn't. <laughs> and I went to Manorham Hospital, and I had a friend there, and I was in the labor ward, four ladies in labor, one midwife. They were really short. And I'm going, God, why won't you let me be a midwife? Can't you see? They need me. And I was so frustrated, I had to walk out. And it was like the Holy Spirit said in my heart, well, what's more important, to be a spiritual midwife or a physical midwife? And I went... Ah, uh, they need delivery now. I haven't seen anybody in Thailand who wants to know you. I've been here 18 months. I'd seen one person. I said, well, you've got to train me. So I went back to my home two hours away Sunday morning. I get, to the, I get home. Like, this is 40 years ago. Thailand's dark, and nobody's interested in the gospel. A young man arrives at the door five minutes after I got home, and he said, could you tell me how to become a Christian? I went, <laughs> What? <laughs> He said, well, actually, um, I went to church this morning. They gave an altar call, but nobody talked to me. I didn't know what to do. And we had a drop-in centre for young people, so it was called the House of New Life, and people knew where to come. And you know what God did? I led them to the Lord, and in that next year, 12 young people came to the Lord. Four of them became pastors. And it wasn't just me. It was, I mean, I was the junior worker with Barbara, the senior worker, who was amazing. But, you know, when God leads... It's awesome. Um, but one of the things I also discovered uh, as I went along, next one, thanks, that um, being human, being somewhat broken, there was God doesn't only call you for a ministry, He actually calls you to move in healing and wholeness. And so my journey, I became very aware of my own weaknesses and inadequacies. Spiritual warfare in Thailand was off the top of the charts, which I knew nothing about from St. Albans or from Navigators. They didn't believe in any of it, so <laughs> nor did I, until I saw it happening in front of me. And, um, yes, yeah, so God began to do a healing work. I love this Japanese kintasang, I think it is, I don't know how you say it. You know, where things that are broken, pottery that's broken, is put back together and it's got gold all the way through it. And I see God doing that in our lives, in my life. The things that we feel we can't be used by God because we've got this, that and the other in our lives. God comes along and he, 
he puts us back together with gold. So there were many times I felt like a common cracked clay pot. And I always knew well, it had to be God's glory flowing through me because it certainly wasn't mine. <laughs> and yeah, there were lots of times when I felt under pressure. But God was always there, although I didn't always know it. I didn't always feel it. At times we don't know what to do, but quitting is not an option. I absolutely knew God's call, and it's in detail in the book. I'd encourage you to read it. I think you find it exciting in the sign-up sheets at the back um, if you're interested. Um, but, you know, we all have broken areas, and the enemy will tell you, well, God can't use you. You know, there's things in our temperament we don't like. There's pain in our lives that can overwhelm us. There's past hurts that we can't forget or unforgiveness that consumes us. But Jesus has already carried our pain. He's already carried our shame and our guilt and our condemnation. And when we recognize it and we're willing to hand it over to him, then he gives us freedom. For me, this has been a lifelong journey, and you'll see it as a theme right throughout the book because uh, God is faithful, and, and Satan is such a deceiver. Sometimes we have strongholds in our lives. We don't know why they that they're there. We don't know why we're held back from doing things. And so um, I often pray God would send me a mentor. And this is where Pan C came in. After I'd been in Thailand about 18 months, I spent the first year in Bangkok learning language. And then you kind of go out, I'm still learning language, but I'm doing some ministry. And you realize how much you really don't know. And I felt desperate. I thought, oh, I'll never get this language. So I said, God, Send me someone, help me. And he sent Pansy. She was a teacher. She'd been deeply involved in Buddhism. She knew the spirit realm. And uh, she was trying to teach me. She'd been a Christian two months. And she, I asked her to teach me the Bible, which she didn't really know. <laughs> but she knew the language. And um, we ended up having amazing conversations, and we ended up having lots of experiences where the occult would manifest right in front of our faces. And um, so I can't spend a lot of time to go into all that, but um, it's in the book. <laughs> she also helped me to set up a student hostel, uh, having young women for discipling, and I had one young woman <clears throat> come and live with me who you've heard, heard me talk about before that yet. And she came as an 18-year-old. The people who came had, had to leave school early to help families. Now they're going to night school, and they came to live with me. And she was hungry, keen. So I prayed with her for the first time in my life. I thought, oh, well, I'll just try and pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That was a big step for someone from St. Albans when we didn't believe in anything like that. <laughs> and my shock was that she manifested an evil spirit, and I'm going, Oh, what have I done wrong? <laughs> What's happened here? I didn't know that she'd been committed to spirits as a child, like most people in Thailand. And uh, when she became a believer, her father was worshipping spirits, and he invited her to come and join the ceremony. It's just rife in Thailand. Every house has a spirit house that they worship every day. Priests come and, and give the house to the Spirits, while it's being built, babies are born, there's spirit strings put on their wrists. So I didn't understand this culture that almost everybody's been given to spirits. So when they come to the Lord, they've got to struggle because it's a tug of war. Anyway, I went to a Pentecostal pastor in, in Bangkok and said, oh, I don't know how to help this girl. And he said, no, your mission doesn't know how to deal with these things. <laughs> but just um, tell her to um, stop using any sort of spiritual gifts and, and study the word. Well, God began to give her dreams and visions and, and prophecies, and she had such a, a real prophecy as a young Christian in the church we were in, and uh, it was about sin among the leaders, and they didn't like it. But it actually was very true, and what she prophesied <laughs> became reality. <laughs> um, and so I kept up the relationship with her over the years. She went to Bible college. She married a pastor. Well, the two of them became pastors, and they uh, ran a church that was for street boys. OMF had a home for the street boys in Bangkok, and uh, they ran the church. And then they got involved in another church, um, eventually um, doing church planting. And she got third stage, fourth stage lung cancer a few years ago, and 
within two months, many of the people who had been diagnosed at the same time as her had gone, but she absolutely believed that God would heal her. And she survived another three years and saw many people healed. And um, sadly, she was, well, God kept her for three years, but then she also became seriously ill and died. But um, she just had such a strong walk with the Lord and such an amazing ministry of healing and deliverance for so many people. It was incredible. So um, my topic today was what I want people to, at home to know. Well, I love Psalm 91, God's faithful protection for us. When you sit enthroned under the shadow of Shaddai, you are hidden in the strength of God most high. He's the hope that holds me and the stronghold to shelter me, the only God for me and my great confidence. He will rescue you from every hidden trap of the enemy and he will protect you from false accusation and any deadly curse. His massive arms are wrapped around you, protecting you. You can run under his covering of majesty and hide. His arms of majesty are a shield, keeping you from harm. It was the only way I knew how to survive. I knew God was all-powerful. But I kept getting confronted with all these spirit occurrences. And you know what? The enemy has hidden traps for all of us. And one time I was uh, church planting in Prabhat and at midnight two young girls came to the door in the middle of a tropical rainstorm banging on the door calling out my name and I went down half asleep and they said, oh, you've got to come and help us. Our house is flooding. And I went, what? <laughs> what do you want me to do? They said, I'll oh, bring your camera. And I'm going, <laughs> nothing made sense. And I thought, no, I don't want to do this. And I thought, oh, I better be a good Christian and go. The thing was that one of, one of these girls, her father was a spirit medium. And I had deliberately never gone to this house. And suddenly at midnight, I, I'm summoned. So we went, my friend and I, took a camera. We took some photos. The house was under flood. And, and, and then they said, I oh, can go home now. And I thought, Okay. <laughs> so I took these photos in to get um, developed, and then I thought, oh, I better drop them off. So I go to this house that I'd never been to before. I walk in, and Father's sitting down here at one end of the room doing a seance with a lady. And uh, I was invited to this end of the room with Mother, and I'm going, oh, my goodness, I know I shouldn't be in here. What am I supposed to do? And he said to the wife, get her a cup of coffee. And I went, don't like coffee. And the Holy Spirit said, don't drink it. And I thought, oh, but I've been learning that it's very rude not to accept hospitality in, in Thai culture. I don't even know that I asked God what I should do. I thought, well, I'll just have a quick sip of the coffee and try and get out of here. Uh, so that night, I had a voice come and say to me, you've been in our temple and you've eaten our food. And I was freaked out. I've never had a, a strong demonic voice like that before that I recognized as demonic. So I prayed and I confessed and I asked God for forgiveness. Well, a few days later, we were training people in the church, four couples, we were training to be um, leaders in the church. So four of these men came to me the next week and they all said, one guy said, oh, I got so angry this week, I cut off, just about cut off my cow's ear and I, I had to stitch it up. They had all fallen into sin. We'd been a year and then nothing had happened. And I realized, and I had to confess to them, well, this is what happened to me this week. And I had to confess to them, I fell into a trap. And you guys have all lost, it's like they lost the protective covering of God. And they had all sinned. And it made me realize, oh, when we do something that's like a trap of the enemy, it affects our spiritual children or our real children. And um, there's many things that go on that we are not always aware of what's happening. But praise God, he sends his angels, he sends his protection, he sends his covering. I went to a prayer group in Bangkok to get some extra prayer for all of us because I didn't know how to deal with it. Um, next one, please. You'll never worry about an attack of demonic forces at night nor have to fear a spirit of darkness coming against you. Don't fear a thing. Whether by night or day, demonic danger will not trouble you nor will the powers of evil launched against you. 
And I was listening to Joseph Prince, and he says, this is a prayer that we need to pray. It's a truth in the scripture, but we need to actually activate it and pray it for ourselves. And I didn't know that then. Um, Even in time of disaster, with thousands and thousands being killed, you will remain unscathed and unharmed. Next one. God sends angels with special orders to protect you wherever you go, defending you from all of them. Do you believe in angels? Great. Do you know them around you, protecting you? It's wonderful. 40 years later, people believe, like in St. Albans Baptist. We've progressed a long way, eh? (laughs) I read a book by Billy Graham that there were angels around you, and I experienced it too in lots of situations. So you'll find some of that in the book too. Um, There's just too much to go into. But yeah, God is really there for us. And he is our protector. And the next one. Here is what the Lord has spoken to me. Because you have delighted in me as my great lover, I will greatly protect you. I will set you in a high place, safe and secure before my face. I will answer your cry for help every time you pray. You will find and feel my presence even in your time of trouble. I will be your glorious hero and give you a feast. You will be satisfied with a full life and with all that I do for you, for you will enjoy the fullness of my salvation. So I want to encourage you that no matter what struggles you're going through, no matter what ups and downs you have in life, God's promises are real. All we have to do is cry out to him. His name is powerful. And even though I often didn't know what to do, he never left me in a situation where... uh, where I couldn't cope or where it was dangerous. Uh, He always sent help or gave me wisdom. Um, But yeah, it was totally being thrown on him. And I'd say to God, well, actually, I don't know what to do. Uh, I was often the only Westerner in the town, and I'd say, well, I've got the Bible. And before one demonic situation happened, I'd got the book Demons Defeated by Bill Skrabitsky. So I said, oh, well, I've got this and I've got that and I've got the Holy Spirit. Help me, God. You know, and half the book said, ring the elders, call the pastor. And I'm going, yeah, right, I'm it. So (laughs) thank you, Jesus. Okay, so what um, do we need to be aware of that can oppose the calling that God's put in our life? Because we're all called. We're all called to be involved and to be a witness. And for me, uh, one of the initial things was emotional pain from abuse. You might have experienced rejection, parents divorced, personal divorce. And what does the enemy do? He gets us buried in our pain, and then he tells us all these lies. Well, God can't use you because you've got this, that, and the other. But the reality is God heals our pain, and we can bring it to him, and, and we can receive healing. Um, I'm only touching on any of these topics because I just want to make you aware. From my experience in Thailand, when a person became a Christian, when I'm planting a a new church, um, for the first year, so Joe becomes a Christian, next week someone in his family dies. And that went on about three weeks. And I'm going, hey, this isn't safe. What's going on here? It felt like Russian roulette. And, the, and it was like the Holy Spirit showing me, these people are coming out of tremendous occult backgrounds. You've got to protect them. You've got to pray. Oh. <laughs> you know, they come and say, look, I'm bruised. I'm black and blue all over. Um, or they'd get depressed, or they'd be hearing negative voices, or they'd um, have a, a serious accident. And I ended up with the names of 12 people who were interested in the gospel and they had reasons why they couldn't believe yet, they all died. And I said to God, I can't share the gospel anymore. This is terrible. How come? And, well, it was pretty scary. And God taught us to have to really be a, um, an intercessor for these people. I thought, well, I can't witness anymore unless I protect them. Next, thanks. So I thought this only happened in Thailand, but as I've been home for 20 years now, I realise similar things happen in New Zealand. Not all the time. And then when they became Christians, they need to renounce their spirit activities. 
If we seek wisdom from any other source but God, and these are some of the ways that uh, we might do it in New Zealand. Seances, palm reading, spirit mediums, new age, which actually is only Hinduism and, and Buddhism coated in a nice Western sort of acceptable way. Crystals, stars, yoga. Do you know what? These are traps. They're traps of the enemy to get us in bondage. And I remember one of my friends was a, a lecturer at university and she said, oh, she's going to buy a car and she'd have it next Monday. So I went on Monday to see the car. Oh, no, I went to the spirit medium and he said I can't get it until another month. And I went, what? And you're a university lecturer? <laughs> it's just rife. It's absolutely rife. And I don't know... You know, we just so often fall into traps without even realising what we're getting involved with. And then we wonder why we're stuck and we can't grow. Next one, thank you. And the key is actually to have relationships with people and to love them and to get to know them and not to be afraid of what they might be involved in or not involved with. Um, I discovered that um, there was occult involvement in my ancestors. I wouldn't believe it, but actually God revealed it. And we had quite a deliverance session at one point for our family when I came home from, from the field. God will show you. You know, if the ancestors have been involved in the occult or in uh, various other things, then it can affect down the generations. And we actually need to take a stand and claim our inheritance and, and set ourselves free. So recently some of us went and had a uh, a seminar on being set free from, what was it? Freemasonry. Um, and I discovered that my grandfather had actually set up the Theosophic Society in Christchurch, which is also um, a lodge type thing that doesn't have, well, it doesn't believe in God. Totally anti God. All very much based on good works. And so during this journey over the last 20 years back home, I've discovered I've needed to be set free from a lot of things. Um, but thank God he doesn't give up on us. Next one. So, yeah, mum, many of us bring things home from overseas, right? We see nice things and we think, oh, well, we'll take that home. And mum had bought this Thai dancing doll that... Um, she didn't realise that it was actually a dancing doll from the temple. Um, or a figure of it, and she had a terrible pain in her mouth, a burning pain for six years that the doctors couldn't heal, total dry mouth, dry eyes, and in the end, God showed me she should um, burn it. And when they burnt it, she was totally healed immediately. I just don't believe that these things happen in New Zealand, but they actually do. And so we need to ask God, you know, what's going on here and why? And um, and these things actually need to be destroyed. If we've got things in our home that we brought back from overseas, ask God, is this okay or has this got something behind it? We want to be free to fully function and all that God has planned for us and be able to share with other people about his love, his power to set us free. And then, of course, we need to invite the Holy Spirit to fill people and baptize them in his love. So... Um, I'm going to ask Miriam to come and lead us in a prayer to help us um, take some authority over some of these things in our life. Thank you, Lord. Mighty God, I come to you in the name of Jesus, my Saviour and my Lord. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross. You forgave my sins, cleansed me, and set me free with your blood. I specifically honor my parents and forgive them for any of their failings relating to my life. Lord, I forgive them. 
Lord, they didn't know what they were doing. And the effect it would have on me. God, I forgive them. I specifically, please set me free from domination, manipulation, and intimidation. Forgive me where I have harbored hurt, bad attitudes, or offenses against others. I forgive those who have hurt me and have acted towards me in an unforgiving way. I refuse to hold resentment, bitterness, or hatred in my heart towards anyone living or dead. Father, forgive me if I have secretly held something against you in my heart. If I have blamed you for any difficult situation in my life, forgive me. I confess as sins these occult practices and my involvement in them. I'm just going to give you a space, a pause here, and you confess those things that you have been involved in and want to repent of. Just speak them out to the Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. My involvement, Freemasonry, crystals, yoga, Whatever it is, God forgive me. God forgive me. Right, moving on. Forgive me where I have sought to gain supernatural knowledge through the dark powers of the occult. I renounce them and I break off all contact with them in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, I break off every occult spirit and curse that has come down from my generations on my father's and mother's side that has passed down through my family line. Witchcraft, sorcery, divination and control or transference of any wrong power. Lord Jesus, forgive me for my involvement in false religions, all false teaching against Bible truth, religious bondage, Freemasonry, lodges, and any secret society. Forgive me. Lord Jesus. Coming close to the end now. I renounce Satan and all his works. I rebuke all demons and count them my enemies. I command every dark spirit to go and demonic control to be broken. I command all such spirits to leave me now in Jesus' name. I call on the name of Jesus. The scripture says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now, just reach out. And if we can have prayer team, just come and pray with these ones that have come forward. Members of the prayer team, just join here and just minister. Let's just reach out and say, come Holy Spirit, where there's been an emptying out, where there has been a, a releasing and a setting free, we say, come Holy Spirit and fill me. Come and overflow me and draw me closer to you as I continue to trust and rely on you day by day. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for my new freedom. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for setting me free in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord.
thanks so much for joining us today. And our prayer is that you have sensed God's presence with you, whether that be through the worship time, whether that be through the message, or the personal story that got shared at the end, but that somehow your heart has resonated with it. And if you would like to let us know how you have been impacted, or you would just simply like to get to know us better, you can email us on office at sabc.org.nz or you could go to our website www.sabc.org.nz or find us on Instagram or Facebook and like, like our page or follow us just to kind of keep in the loop of what we're up to here at SABC. Once again, we've loved having you join with us. Hare Rafa now.